I was mentioning junglers before, and for a while I was their blue-eyed boy. Um, I used to like, I've always liked going on in the middle rather than at the end, particularly there because people tend to get a bit drunk. Um, and I liked to, well, before they got drunk, and I used to close the first half because people didn't want to follow me because they went so mental that they were scared. Although I thought it wouldn't be a problem because I'm not somebody who puts them into a raucous or aggressive mood. I thought anybody could follow me and it, I just sort of a good warm up act for them, as it were. Mm. And this all went on very well. And then Maria's husband, John Davy, got involved. And he was going to start an, uh, an, um, some sort of management agency. And he was going to, I remember him having this talk with me, and it was going to be a bit like an RAF roundel. There were the people he worked a bit with. And as you got near the centre, they're the ones that really were going to be the star people they were going to represent. And I was one of them. This is what I was told. Now, for a while, they controlled all the people that came in, and it was they were, they were good audiences. It was full and exciting. I mean, it's very difficult to explain how exciting it was in the mid-'80s to go down to Jonglers. It was just, wow, you felt, this is where it's all happening, and it's this is the future, and this is, boom, you got the feeling you were in the middle of it. And then John joined in and decided to make a business out of it. And other clubs were added and also they were much less careful about who was let in. Any old body would be let in, um, stagnites, drunks, all sorts of people. And there was a lot more heckling started going on and all that sort of love. But it didn't matter because they were paying money in the door. And I had the odd dodgy gig, as we all do. And I stopped doing them, and then they opened a new club in Camden. And I thought I'd try and do that one. And I went along, and I did my gig, exactly the same stuff I'd been doing a few months before in Battersea. But it was a different audience, and two-thirds, three-quarters of it was exactly the same as before. They enjoyed it, and they were good at listening. But there was a now a raucous, drunk audience... And they didn't want they, they didn't a want to listen to music. They were started as soon as I started singing. They started talking as if I were background music because they weren't listening. And I can't remember if they were heckling or not. It's more that they were talking. And I remember somebody making a signal to me that I should get off. Now I don't leave the stage when I'm on. What I might do is take a middle song out and shorten my set. But I don't want hecklers to think that they can affect what goes on in stage. I don't want to give them that power. So I carried on to the end of my song, and I carried on. At least I tried to, sorry. And in the middle of my last song, John Davy pulled the mic on me. So then I had to leave the stage because nobody could hear me, and I was very annoyed. And this is the man, remember, who told me that he was, you know, I was going to be his blue-eyed boy, and I was going to be the centre of his blah, blah, blah. And, um, and I naturally went over to remonstrate and say, you do not pull the mic on me when I'm on stage. And his reply, I can remember this day, was very simple. Fuck off, be funny. That was his reply. And he was renowned as being somebody who couldn't go on stage himself. Apparently he was dragged on stage once, I heard a story. And there was apparently a small stain in the trousers department resulted from this sudden appearance. But that was his reply, and from that day to this, I've never stepped into a junglers club, nor will I. Um, and it's a shame, because it started off wonderful. Um, Joan Collins fan club, you know that is, don't you? I know of it. It's Julian Clary's who it is. He had his little dog, oh. and this dog was absolutely entranced with Julian. And it was called Fanny the Wonder Dog, and it wore a little, a sort of little bead necklace. And it was, I think it was one of those little terriers, whatever you call them. Um, anyway, it would only look at him. Nobody else. Mm. We tried, Pat, no, not interested. He just wanted Julian, nobody else. And there were some wonderful acts. Kit Hollerbach. Um, oh, and somebody, else, you asked me who's underrated. Jeremy. What's his surname? Um, cool. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> 
No, he's he he's sometimes on those political comedy shows on the radio. He's but he ought to be a bigger comedian than he is. Oh yes, I, let me mention somebody else to answer that question. The one who I think one of the he used to be on Junglers in the early days, and he's Irish, and he now lives in Scotland. And his name is Michael Redmond. Do you know Michael Redmond? You're the second person to name him. Wonderful. I remember his first two jokes. He came on stage at Jonglers in a fairly drunken evening and he stood there in his Mac and his droopy moustache and looked round the room saying nothing, which is dangerous. And he finally said, Like most Irishmen, I was born a Catholic. This came as a great surprise to my parents because they're both Jewish. And then the second one was, my grandfather died in his rocking chair. I was only three at the time. I didn't realize it would keel over like that when I climbed on the back of it. And, and you never knew where yeah. where that joke was going. He's one. And the other one... Do you want to know who the other person is? Who? Who? Who, who else? Uh, do you know Jeremy Lee? Yeah, he's, a, he's an agent. He runs JLA, which is the largest comedy booking, uh, uh, corporate booking agent yes. in the UK. Funny you say that because I've got somebody who works for them who keeps on trying to get me booked by them. But Jeremy doesn't seem to be interested in it. Okay. Um, and, and his son is now over. And they're, guess what? They want younger comedians. That's the problem with that. Um, but I've got a, I've got a, I've got a mole in there who's on my side. Well, interesting enough, they want younger comedians, but older politicians. Because when I spoke to him, he said that all the politicians who've retired or stopped doing it or whatever are on that circuit immediately. Oh, on, oh, in his books, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, sure. Well, the the one I saw who was wonderfully funny, I, I posted one of his speeches because it was genius. Was um, uh, an ex chancellor of the Exchequer. Can you think of who I mean? There you go. I'm, I'm just trying to think of his name. Oh, you're asking me if I know the name? Yes. I thought you were asking me if I could guess who it was. Well, that too. Um, <laughs> he was... Um, I'm not very good with politics, I'll be honest. Oh, you'd know him. He was wonderful. He was had the bushy eyebrows and he was Labour. Uh, I can't think of it. But if you go on YouTube... Google bushy height Labour. No, no, no. <laughs> it, 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 it was a speech about against Thatcher. That's the team was a chancellor. Uh, it was the shadow chancellor during that time. Mm-hmm. And uh, he did a speech about Thatcher. Um, she just made a thing about, you know, that anybody in the cabinet should never speak unless they cleared things with the rest of the cabinet. And her friend in America, the president, wanted to land planes in England on the way to bombing Libya. And without consulting her cabinet, she said yes overnight while the people, her own cabinet people in Europe were saying, no, we don't really want this to happen. And she does. And this was um, his speech about it. And it's, it's like a wonderful stand-up routine, but with knives hmm. included. And I put it up on that. But, um, yeah, I mean... <coughs> <coughs> yeah, that, that's what they want. Anyway, I, I, again, he's probably one of these... Well, his son's seen me... But he has not chosen me because they want. They've got this thing every year they do called um, the Real Variety Show or something. Okay. And they book people who to play at this place, uh, and uh, this friend of mine who's like the mole in there tried to get me on it last year, and Jeremy's son. No, they were looking for younger people. I'm actually. I'm glad you said that because I've got to remind him because it's in September and it'll be coming up soon. Mm. Maybe have another go. Hmm. Um, I don't know how it went last year, but I, I know that the people, the sort of people that they have, the sort of corporate, it's the sort of thing that, that like what I do, plus it works abroad because you don't need to speak so much English to understand. Now, what was I going to tell you the story about? Oh, yeah, the other the other underrated stand-up, and he doesn't even realise how good she is. I keep telling her. I think she thinks I'm just being sarcastic. I think it's uh, Harry, uh, Hattie Hayridge. Okay. I think she's wonderful. I've Again, do you not know? No, I don't know. She was the face on Red Dwarf for a while. Oh, Holly, uh, Hetty, Hetty, the opposite of Holly, the the woman. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Again, I've never seen her do stand up, but I know well, what you mean. What she used to do, John, in the eighties, 
Uh, the first joke I remember of hers was, I hate it when you go to a restaurant and they say, how many of you are there? So I say, there are many of us, some are here already, but we all look like you, earthling. Right? I used to pretend I liked, was an original idea. Mm. And the other one, we did the worst gig in the world. She and I were booked for the, I love this, the social club of the Essex Police Force. And they were very... Quite the secret policeman's book with it. No. <laughs> and they were very shocked the previous month because they'd used bad language. Because they had their wives there, you see. So they booked Hattie and I. And you could hear the wind going over their head as everything we said and they didn't understand. And um, Hattie did a joke. She said, I just moved in to a flat with a girlfriend. I don't like it, she said. Every night, all I can hear is, ah, 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 ah. So we've had the hunt in three times. I just thought it was lovely. Lovely, nice. lovely original ideas. So she's another underrated one. Anyway, there you go. Hello, and welcome to the RC Industry Podcast, episode 53. For those of you new to the show, I'm Simon Kane, and this is the podcast where I interview the most influential people from the worlds of stand up, comedy, radio, TV, and today, the live circuit. Earl Oaken has been performing for over 40 years. He's a comedian and musician, and one of the most honest and open guests we've ever had on. I actually had to consider getting some legal advice before putting this one out because he was just so bluntly honest about promoters, agents, bookers, and the Edinburgh Fringe and his experiences with all of those. I think it's a great episode. I think everyone who has anything to do with the performing side of the industry will get something out of this. Uh, we I really enjoyed talking to him about why there are so few musical comedians, why there are less opportunities for musical comedians, why there are less good musical comedians in his opinion, and hundreds of things in between. Uh, This podcast, believe me, is not just for musical comedians. If you're thinking at this point, I'm not a musical comedian, I don't know, hopefully that intro will have given you some sort of understanding as to what we got into detail-wise, and the discussions about gigs and the circuit and how it's changed and how it was 40 odd 50 odd years ago and how it is now and how it's grown up and it really just gave me a a better overview of especially the london circuit and the edinburgh and yeah i just i I think it's an amazing episode Uh, i'm really proud of it and i'm really happy with it i'm aware it's long believe me it took me enough time to edit it down to what it is today and uh but but i think i've left in everything that was actually worth leaving in so yeah should also point out Earl had a bit of a cough uh, during this podcast recording. I did edit out most of them, but there are a few in there that are still I just can't get rid of. So sorry about that. Uh, also, he opened a packet of, of, of biscuits or bickies, as he puts it, uh, about halfway through. Couldn't get rid of that because I was asking a question and I, I didn't notice how close it was to the to the mic. So sorry about that as well. Very quick ways you can support the podcast. I've said them a billion times, but I'm going to say them in every episode. Uh, please leave it a review it really would help we're at 49 let's get it over 50 that'd be really helpful join the Facebook group that's amazing honestly it's growing really quickly and it would really help get more people into that Um, and share this pod with a friend if you have a moment where you think oh comedian x or or whoever would love this episode please share it with them tag me in it and I'll thank you for doing it that'd be amazingly useful also if you are someone who lives in Scotland Edinburgh and Glasgow specifically I'm coming up to do my show uh, on my tour so if you would like to see me please look in the show notes and you can see I've got three shows up there uh, one on the 12th in Edinburgh one on the 16th in Glasgow and one on the 17th in uh, just outside of Edinburgh so if you can come that would be great if you can't come don't worry about it I'm not going to blame you Um, I'll I'll come to your city don't you know do too much traveling but if you can come that'd be amazing I will leave the links in the show notes because I don't want this intro to go on too long so without any more delays this is Earl Oaken I haven't got a high regard for for Chortle I don't think it's very all embracing it understands a very small specific chunk of comedy and the rest it doesn't really understand at all so because you because would you describe yourself as an alternative actor or musical how would you encompass what you do as a, if, you, if you had to well, I'm it. certainly a music act, and, mm. and that's become alternative because very few of us do it. Mm. And the ones that do it tend to be stand-ups who use a bit of music as a joke. 
and they'll do a couple of lines with wrong words from a current pop song. And but they're ma- they're really stand ups using music as part of their stand up routine. <clears throat> and I come from it from an, the exact opposite. I'm really a musician who's learnt to add comedy. And indeed, when I'm doing my full show, the comedy songs will only be some of what I have on offer. And indeed, when I'm doing a music show, the sort of comedy that I'll do may be very different and too sophisticated for a comedy club. And indeed, it occasionally needs for me to do the original straight song for people to understand what I'm doing to it, because they might be an old song that people of this generation don't know. So it's a whole range of things. So I'm certainly alternative, but not in the sense you probably mean it, but simply that I'm different. Um, perhaps some people use the word quirky, uh, but it's I'm not really quirky, because that suggests that I'm sort of weird. Uh, I'm just, I'm, in a way, I'm sort of old school, but not in the sense that, you know, people, I won't say my mother knows fat, not that sort of thing. But in a way, I go back much further than that. In a way, I go back to uh, what was music called a hundred years ago and what was variety in the 30s. And then there was a gap and they stopped doing it. And I'm doing what they did, but obviously in the 21st century, so it comes out sounding different. Mm. But I'm more in that tradition than anything else. So you, And you've been doing this 40 years now? Mm. Well, I've been singing on stage mm. for 60 years. Okay. Um, I went pro in the 70s. I mean, I did the folk clubs in the 70s. And that's really where I learnt my stagecraft. There were a lot of people who were the first alternative comedy people, if you want to call it that. People like Jasper Carrot was on the comedy circuit, mm-hmm. but it was called the folk circuit. Because um, if you see early films of him, he had a guitar around his neck. Another person who was a banjo player who was very funny, who was on the folk circuit, was called Billy Connolly. So I worked with Pin. There was a guy called Mike Elliott who was hilarious. And I think he's the one who used to just talk. So he was like the first stand-up of the modern era in many ways because he didn't tell gags that somebody had written. He sort of talked about his life, which is what modern alternative comedy is. And he was doing that in the 70s. So I was in that circuit and... Re- gradually making my name when it sort of suddenly died on me but around the same time I was also doing opening acts for first of all folk acts that were big like Ralph McTell then folk rock which was Fairport Convention and we did a lot of work together all over Europe Um, and then on the more straight pop rock side I opened on tour for Van Morrison in 79, and then finally what got me out of my day job, which I was a deputy head by then, um, the Wings tour in 79. I remember a couple of years later I was on the Parkinson show. Uh, and then I had a great, well, pretty much since then, I've hardly been on the box in England because what happened was I did start, the, my first comedy gig pretty much was... Uh, due to a gentleman called Nigel Planer asking me to come along because, believe it or not, there were no comedians in 81, 82, apart from people who did, you know, mother-in-law jokes. And I said, no, I don't do that. I don't. I, said, I remember saying to him, I'm not really a comedian, but I do a bit of comedy. He said, oh, please come down. Because there weren't anybody that they could use. And it was called The, the Comic Strip, and I was on with... Totally unknown people who were Rick Mayle and Adrian Edmondson, uh, Nigel Planer and Peter Richardson, French and Saunders. Um, Arnold Brown had just started doing it. Um, I, I know this story from another angle because yeah. I worked with Nigel Planer's uh, cousin at a social media agency. <coughs> well, okay. He was telling me about his, should we say, eclectic. Uh, career as a as an uh, as an actor because he pops up in things, yes, but yes. doesn't quite pursue it as such. People yes. just keep asking him to. I think he was he was thinking um, in the young ones, um, just for everyone else's reference. I can't remember what character he played, but he played one of the young ones. He was a hippie. Yeah, he was, he a, was hippie. a hippie guy. Yeah, yeah, 
Um, yeah, no, that's how I knew about you because he mentioned that uh, his uh, uncle had invited you to that and talked a lot about the comic strip. That was the first time I heard about you. His uncle? Yeah, his uncle is Nigel Planer. Oh, I see, your yeah. friend. I'm oh, sorry, yeah. I, thought, I thought you meant you know, uh, Nigel Planer's uncle. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I understand. Yeah, well, I'm, I met him. He, he and Peter came down uh, to the 606 to try out their sketches on jazz musicians because hmm. they understood that jazz musicians, and this is true, had a sort of weird sense of humour and he wanted to see how it well. And I remember the sketch they did, it was a sketch uh, somehow could do it today because it was about terrorists taking over London Airport. Only in his thing, they weren't putting bombs around, they were putting people in giant microwave ovens and they mimed being cooked alive. It was very black, but very funny. Mm. And uh, uh, it went down very well. Mm. And particularly, it went down well because normally on that Sunday evening, the guy who ran the jazz club, who was a bit of a lovey, had used to write sketches and do them for us, and they were awful, and we had to sort of sit there and sort of go, ah, yeah, mm -hmm, and want to sink through the floor with embarrassment. So as, as soon as you say, can we perform it? Yes, yes, now, please, now. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's like at the end of a gig when someone comes up to me and goes, I've got a joke for you, and you have to stand there and go, yeah. Okay. Oh, no, it's just much worse than oh, this. <laughs> because the guy who ran the place oh, okay. was the one who was writing the stuff. Um. And it wasn't a joke, it went on for half an hour every week. Mm. And you had to remember not to come in too early on a Sunday or you would be subjected to this awful stuff and he was a nice man but he had no no anyway it's a long story very very long ago that's okay so well the other thing we talked about this was slightly uh the, the other option i was going to go with mm. was uh you said that so okay musical acts are not niche but there's less and less of them at the moment is, is the way that we were talking before and i don't know if there's less and less of them um okay. there never have been many on yeah. the circuit and one of the reasons is, to do it really well, you need two real skills. You've got to be able to be funny, genuinely, and you've got to be genuinely a good musician. It's the people that I have little time for, as, as I was saying before, the ones who are basically a stand-up, and they've written a couple of funny alternative lyrics, not the entire song, just a couple of lines to some current pop song, quite often it's obscene, uh, which I'm not shocked by it, but I'm bored by it. It means that they've got no originality in their mind and they've got to rely on mentioning bodily functions or body parts to get a laugh. And I think, oh really, is that all you can come up with? Um, that's my reaction to it personally and lots of people get laughs on it and they think they're wonderful but I go oh yeah, really I mean you know hmm. uh, so the number of people who can do music comedy at a higher level is quite small because you need more than one talent you've got you should be able for instance to do a full music gig without being funny okay okay and you should be able then to add your comedy to it. Uh, that's what being a music comedy act entails, as far as I'm concerned. People like Ronnie Golden, for instance, can do that, you know? And there are a few people around who can. And there are one or two people um, who are actually major musicians and we, I didn't even know um, until they started doing a, a whole full two-hour show which involves comedy and classical music, for instance. Rainer Hirsch is a good example of that. He was on the circuit as a stand-up. I had no idea he was a proper classical musician until he started doing that show. And, I mean, I'm in awe of that because I can't do that. But that's real music comedy. I am in a different sense. I I'm come from the jazz world and I can, well, I do play Ronnie Scott's. So, you know, I'm also a real musician in my genre and I'm a, you know, I think my best, skill is probably as a songwriter so you've always been and, and I hope you don't feel the wrong way always been a kind of alternative act in all the markets you've been in because it sounds like when you started or got invited to come down to the comic strip 
it was because you weren't doing mother-in-law jokes. You were something completely different. And then, and now, like you said, there's very few people... Well, I mean, the thing is, they... I don't think they knew much about comedy. They were just starting themselves. Mm. And they were desperate to find other people to fill the bill. And they didn't want people... I mean, he told me the rules that night. The rules are no sexual or racial stereotypes, but you can say fuck. I mean, that, they, that was the rule. They were the rules of alternative comedy at the time, put in a nutshell. Mm. And what I did um, didn't involve any stereotyping, although I have been accused of Bessie being very rude to women, but I didn't think of it in those terms. Um... But, and of course, I, I don't really swear very much because it's not really part of what I do. And I don't, it just, again, it's irrelevant. There's once, I think I use it, swear word twice in in an hour show, maybe, because I could think of no word that worked better. Mm. But um, was I alternative to him? I don't know. I, I just think he wanted somebody that wasn't what they were trying to avoid. So in that but I don't think he was aware of the comedy that went on in folk clubs because he was pretty young then. And I'd, you know, I'd been performing for 10, 12 years. I was the experienced one. Mm. I know I, I tell this to people, they don't believe me, but that night when I went on with all those people who have since become famous, I, I went down best. And I think it's because, A, they could understand what I was doing better because they were way out on a limb. And also because I'd been performing for 12 years. And they hadn't. They'd only been doing it probably for months or a year or two at most. So um, yeah, that well, that's where it started anyway. And you and you told me that you mainly play folk clubs at the moment, jazz clubs. Is that right at the moment? Or not folk clubs? They they died. That's exactly why I went into comedy clubs. They often started in the very same pubs and clubs where I'd been performing three months before the folk club closed down. Comedy club started up. Boom! I was in there. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's. So. Let's let's look, let's do a timeline thing really quickly. So mm -hmm. when was you? When did you first start performing? As in, like music. When did you first start performing? Well, when I was three years old, and and when I was six and seven, I used to go around old age clubs with my dad playing the guitar, and I sang. I got recordings of myself singing. I was on mm. TV when I was twelve, um, playing singing with my guitar. Then, you know, you go to school and I went to university and I sang at the folk clubs there and so forth and so on. I came out and started doing all, and I was sort of leading light of the folk club at my university. Then I went on, uh, around that time, I was signed to Dick James, because I started writing pop songs of the time. And Dick James was important to be with, because apart from anything else, he was the publisher for the Beatles. And he got me to record at Abbey Road which I did, and people like Cilla Black, Georgie Fame, Helen Shapiro recorded my songs. This is all the 60s. Mm. And, this is, and you were still doing folk clubs at this point? Uh, not yet. Okay. I, was, I was doing my degree, okay. and I only graduated in 68. Then I come home, mm -hmm. start working as a schoolmaster, and the more years I did it, the less I enjoyed doing it. And to make it worth getting up in the morning... I used to look around for something to do in the evening, which was usually places like the Troubadour or the Half Moon Putney. These were uh, folk clubs where you could go in and sing a couple of songs, and then if they liked what you did, you'd say to the organiser, how about me having a gig here? Which meant you had to have two half-hour sets. And part of those two half-hour sets would be comedy. So the result was, by the time that I met Nigel Planer, all I did was to make a 20 minute set, was take the comedy bits out of what I was doing already, and that was my 20 minute set. I didn't build up from five minutes and 10 minutes. And mm. By the way, I was writing silly songs at university. I mean, we'd made fun of Beatles songs. We'd, wrote, we'd write alternative lyrics like, instead of, I think I'm gonna be sad. You know, you know that song? Mm -hmm. you know, we, I think I'm going to be sick all over the floor. It started off. And, you know, we did that sort of thing. Uh, there was an old song from World War I called It's a Long Way to Tipperary. And that became, because of the Cold War, with a Russian accent that we say, It's a long way to East Siberia. It's a long way to walk. But there's 
scared that I might talk. And it's that sort of thing I started. I was, you know, 17, 18. Is, is that how Sony Records n- noticed you? Is that how no, they, no, no, no. No, because uh, they didn't see Sony, you doing Sony it. is uh, 30 years later. Okay. Um, but that's when I started <laughs> performing. And then, as I said, in, but when I did the Wings tour, and then I was on uh, Parkinson, that's about 1979. I've been doing a decade of folk clubs. Hmm. And at virtually about 1980, 81, the folk clubs die, the comedy clubs take their place, and I move seamlessly from one to the other. <coughs> and um, apparently I'm still doing it. So here was my, the reason I wanted that timeline, just so people who maybe because a lot of comedians who listen to this probably don't remember folk clubs and don't remember the transition. No. Now, what made that track was there like a just folk went out of fashion yes or was it, okay. I, think, I think that's exactly what it was right uh it was no longer cool it was suddenly suddenly seen as old hat and a bit sort of uncool um and it was replaced because the 60s was over you know right and so everything had to be different and new i remember the early 80s for a while there was a backlash against anything that was political humour. Yeah, I mean, for a while it was uncool to do political satire because that was regarded as old hat. It was that was the week that was, was old. Uh, not so much a programme was old. All this stuff was old. So now I had to be different from that. And, of course, the 80s was the time of Thatcher and it was a different mindset. So it... For a while, that went out of fashion. It's, it's come back now in a different form. But that went out. And so, and what I did was I nobody. Uh, and um, so it sort of worked from the beginning. But I always have to, and I, from that time till now, people come to a comedy club expecting somebody, rest, if you don't mind me saying so, a bit like you, check shirt over a pair of jeans. That's almost the comedian's uniform. uniform. And you tuck yours in, which is uh, what they seem to do. No, right? no, I don't. No, you're not. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, no, you are wearing the official uniform. Yeah, I'm very aware <coughs> of this. And I'm, I'm trying to find stuff I can wear that doesn't make me look like every other middle Well, I, yeah, well, I, I never did. I, I dress like the way I do because when I was a little boy, I got very, very interested in the great opera singers of 100 years ago. And my hero was Caruso or Puccini or whatever. And they dressed like I'm dressed today, with spats, a Victorian cravat, and so forth. And, you know, it's like some people dress like Elvis Presley. I dress like Caruso. But pe- because people don't know about Caruso, they don't realise why. And I, I now don't they, they feel... They think you're trying to be eccentric, maybe. or they don't I, don't, I don't know what they're thinking, but whatever it is... I feel comfortable wearing this stuff. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable wearing a shirt that's not buttoned. No, <laughs> uh, well, any shirt that's not buttoned at the neck, I feel wrong. Okay. You know, I'd be a lousy Jeremy Corbyn, I really would, because I keep wanting to do my button up and put a tie on. Uh, but I hate Tories, so it's a sort of uh, difficult... Yeah, it's, it's, more it's, more di- yeah. it's very complicated. My, I, I feel, the, I feel the, the exact opposite. I, whenever I have to... So I went to a, a wedding recently, and yeah. a few weeks before that I went to a funeral, and both times I was with my family, and they said, you know, you're going to have to put a tie on. Like and, and the minute that I spoke to the, the person there who was sort of either grieving or getting married, and I said, can I take it off? And they were like, yeah, you're fine. Immediately it was off because yeah. I but, just. But you, but you don't you don't love Tories as well. No, no, no. that's a whole different. Yeah, yeah. So you, said, you, said, you said the opposite. So I was just, that's a different. Just podcast. checking. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's I I I understand, but I I, I guess yeah, you, you being yourself in stand up in general is is key to to first of all finding why you're funny, and second of all making a connection with your audience. So I guess the people you, that you turn off. Look, I know, I always say to to young performers on the comedy circuit there's two things they've got to do they've got to work out who they are uh, it's such a vague thing to do but you know I know that my character is a silly character that thinks he's a sex symbol when he obviously isn't uh, so that's where I come from uh, and I keep double crossing them on that point and then you know because I'm always introduced as musical genius and sex symbol so 
they come, I come on, they see me in this suit, and they're going, what? And then I take it further by the first thing I always say, and that's the next thing I tell young performers. Your opening line tells people who you are. Mm. You've got to have a, a line where you go, ah, right, I know where he is. And my opening line is very simple. I just say, hello, ladies. And it looks so stupid coming from me that they all laugh. And from then on, they're on my side as a rule. Mm. So... Have you had that opening line for your entire career then? Or, or? No, it, I don't know where it came on. Um, I was performing in LA. I had a longer introduction I used to use, putting myself down. But I suddenly realised it's better to pretend that you believe in yourself. I was in LA at the time, and I was performing at the comedy store, the original comedy store, not the one here with this mad lady called Mitzi something or other sitting there. And... Um, Mitzi Shaw. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I I said to the compare, whatever they call it, MC, can you give me... Could you please introduce... Oh, and we don't really do introduction. I said, just four words, you see, and I wrote it down. And I saw him smile, and he knew he'd do it, you see. And everybody else had come on, and the first thing they'd all said was, so how you doing tonight? You all right? Every house, you, you fine? Like, what are you, a doctor? You know, what's the point of saying that? Everybody says it. <laughs> and what that says to the audience is, hello, I am a comedian who will have nothing original to say in the next 25 minutes. And I thought, that's really wrong. And that was the first time, and I just sat down. He, he did use the four words. I came on, and I looked even more weird to them because, you know, it was in America. And then I just sat on the stool and I thought rather bravely didn't say anything for about 15 seconds, but just perused the audience from side to side slowly. And then I leant forward and into the mic. And again, a lot of American comedians who haven't worked out that that round thing at the end of the wire makes their voice louder. They always sent a sort of hector and scream into it. And I just let down, almost whispered, I said, hello, ladies. And it got a huge laugh. Mm. And from that moment to this, I've used it as my hello. Yeah, there's a lot of experienced comics have told me that you sh just don't <coughs> ask. I think it was, I suppose, Daniel Sloss a few months ago, and he mm. told me that, uh, I think it was Glenn Wool or someone like that, said you should never ask how they're doing because you don't care. Yeah. So you're, start unless, you're starting on a lie. So as, <laughs> unless you say, unless you say, hi, as well, you, I don't know, I, I, I really don't care. Mm. And that will get a laugh. Yeah, I, I did for a few gigs go, uh, how you doing? And then they'd go, yeah, we're great. And i go, I'm fine, thanks for asking. Just to kind of mm. put them on ease and stuff. And, and now I ask, <laughs> now I ask him, has everyone, like I literally just go on stage and go, has everyone seen the film Fight Club? And usually they go, yes. And I go, great. Well, none of you paid attention to the first rule of Fight Club. And that normally gets a laugh. And immediately they're like, oh, okay, well, the, why is he, why would he ask it? And then... And it usually puts them on edge, but I like I, it. I never do that because, for instance, in my case, I haven't seen it. Hmm. And because... Have you never seen Fight Club? I've never even heard of it till you mentioned it. Really? Um, okay, there's... Uh, right. but, but that's the whole point. That's amazing. Like, that, that's why I never, ever mention things unless I'm absolutely or 90% certain that everybody's heard of it. Because if they haven't, then you've lost them. So, I mean, you know, I could mention Charlie Chaplin or Frank Sinatra hmm. or something which is universal. But if I were to... I, I'm always worried when I do Teenage Dirtbag, and the first thing I do when I get to a country is, was this a hit here? Was it known yeah. here? Because if it isn't, then it's pointless me doing that song. Well, that's, that's interesting, because... OK, so I, I've been doing a lot of uni gigs at the moment, mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I'm going around uh, different places, and most, most of the crowds I'm doing are millennials to sort of maybe early 40s, like age range-wise. And I would say 90 to 95% of them have seen Fight Club, right, the film. Now... I, what is it? It's just, it's just a film, like there's, uh, but it's a cult classic of a film. So, um, and and there's a bigger joke that builds off it. It's not the, it's not just a throwaway thing at the start. I I don't. It doesn't matter because the next bit is, you know, like so. It's not you know you don't need to know the film to know the joke, but the opening bit, the idea is just to throw them off and to make sure they all know rhetorical questions are literally you don't need to answer them. Okay. Because I have a lot of them. And, and it builds to a callback, and I don't want them to get involved. Oh, okay. So I've built it in for that. 
But it's interesting because you are of a you are you, when you when you started, you've been doing this so long now that I imagine you've got so many references that you actually have to think harder about whether they're going to get them or not. No, I don't use references. You see, I mean, except very very general ones. Hmm. So I mention country and western music, the genre, not any particular song. Okay. Most people have heard know what a country song is. Yeah, yeah. And then I begin to tell them how terrible it is and, and etc. But is, is that are you avoiding it because you don't want to alienate? Is it, it's just you don't want to alienate anyone. No, because I. What's the point of making a joke about something they don't know what I'm talking about? If I went to America and I made jokes about Manchester United, they'd look at me completely blank faced because they wouldn't know what I was talking about. So I, I try and talk in very. So I, my subject matters have always tended to be sex, food. You know, things that it doesn't matter where you are, you will know about it. Country mm. and Western music, you know, they know that, etc., yeah. uh, etc. Et so that, that's always been what I've done to avoid the, the risk. I mean, the, the, only, the only exception is, is the, the version I've done of Teenage Dirtbag. Right, I saw that on YouTube. And that came, that came as part of the... Uh, of, of a... It was a sort of uh, tryout for a TV show that never actually happened in the end. And I was asked, the idea was that there would be, I've forgotten who it was that was supposed to be. It was a, it was a sort of silly show about pop music. And the idea was that after who, whichever the guest of the week, which would be a stand-up comedian, was interviewed about the week's releases, they then go over to me and they would say, whatever the song was, the same joke would, would be, what do you think of X, Y and Z, you see? Whatever the song was. And, I, and my, my reply would always be, yeah, it's all right, but the original version was much better. And I would then sing the original version of it. I remember doing with Robin Ince, we did... Uh, a sort of Las Vegas lounge singer's version of It Was A Me. Nice. And that was very silly, because Robin Ince read the shaggy bit without the slightest attempt changing his normal middle-class English accent. I can imagine. And I was going, honey came in, hey, as if I was one of those terrible, cheesy... Yeah. And it was very funny. Do you know, <clears throat> do you know Richard Cheese? I have met him, but I don't know him. Oh, OK. Yeah, uh, yeah he, does, he does lounge covers and mm -hmm. songs like that, so I can imagine... Uh, I'm trying to imagine what he would do and what you would do and the differences between the two right now. Well, I was at piano, and I, I mm. remember that. I don't do it anymore, and I only did it once with, with Robin. And he, Rob, I think I, it was Robin that made me laugh, because he just sort of... Um, and he would just read out what Shaggy's lyrics were but with no attempt to be anything else than Robin Ince. And it was just... I just thought it was very funny. Mm. So that's when it started, and I started... But the one that worked the best was Teenage Dirtbag, and I kept that one. OK. And... So when, when the folk clubs were going to comedy clubs, yeah. did you find, I and mean, you said that it worked seamlessly, did you, you didn't find that you, were, you lost like gigs or, or a, a, an amount of income while it was sort of transitioning? Cause well, I'd only just gone full-time pro. Oh, okay. I was still doing folk clubs and tours, not necessarily in England. C can I ask how you, just because everyone defines going pro differently... Yeah. So I just wondered how you defined it when you went pro. I gave up my day job, that's what. Okay. Um, so I had no income to rely on. Right. And that meant I had to live off my ill-gotten gains from performing. Okay. Didn't necessarily mean uh, comedy gigs, but performing. Mm -hmm. I had a manager at that time called uh, John Jones, sadly no longer with us. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but gradually he was able to get me less and less gigs because there were less and less gigs to be got. I mean, there is still a very small folk circuit in this country, but it's nowhere near what it once was. Mm -hmm. I visited every hamlet and village of Great Britain at some point or another, mainly back in the 70s, because we, we did tours like that. Mm -hmm. But I, I was so I was doing that. I was still doing the odd folk tour of places like Holland and Belgium, where it still carried on, uh, I was doing all sorts of things. And, and there weren't many comedy gigs to be got, remember. There was a comic strip. There was a place 
called uh, Zenon, which probably still is a discotheque halfway down Piccadilly, that decided it was going to do comedy on a Sunday evening. I did that. And then around 81, 82, whenever it was, I started doing uh, the one club that was called Jonglers. And it was fantastic. I loved going there. It's, it's very difficult to explain to people how different it was to what it's become. At that time, it was run by Maria Kempinska, and it started somewhere in the mid-80s. And by the way, in 83, my man... Oh, I was doing... I've forgotten about this. I sometimes was booked into um, art centres to do a two-hour show based either on songwriting and songs of people like Hoagie Carmichael with some humour mixed in. So I was doing that as well. And in 83, my manager thought I ought to go out and do the Edinburgh Festival, which at that time was a very different animal to what it is now, and we knew nothing about it, and we got it all wrong the first year, and I was lucky to escape without having lost money. But I never did lose money doing Edinburgh. I always made money every year I went. Um, but that was the first year I went up there. So that, that sort of fed into what, what I was doing. A bit of this, bit of that, a bit of the other. Uh, and and then, as I say, Jongler started up. And I, the reason I mentioned Edinburgh is that I, for a long time, understood that um, Maria Kempinska, who was really the person who started it, rather than her husband, uh, had based it to some extent on the late night upstairs room at the Fringe Club. As in late life? No, no, oh, no, no, this doesn't exist anymore. The Fringe Club was run by the Fringe Society. It's where there is now the place that looks like a castle. What, what is it? TV at Row. Okay, yeah, yeah. But that was run by the actual Fringe Society. Oh, okay. And they had two performing areas where you could sign yourself in on, in an exercise book that was lying around. So it was, nobody was booking it, you booked it in, and you could do 10 minutes or a quarter of an hour, whatever it was, 20 minutes, I can't remember now. And if people liked you, you give them leaflets and you get more people coming to your show. And I used to do, that's how I got audiences back then. We're talking early, mid-80s. So it was like a selection show, but was not, not booked as such from a central source. You just went and signed your name up in the morning and then the evening did a gig. Yes, or okay. it, not necessarily you could sign yourself up for four days' time. It was just literally okay. an exercise book, school exercise book. Right. Uh, and it wasn't just comedy. I mean, you got a blues singer followed by an entire youth musical, mm. followed by a juggler, followed by a whatever. Where, where were you performing? <clears throat> because it was, there was no... Was there a free fringe at this point? No. Okay. Oh, no. So... Oh, okay. That's years later. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You've got to remember, I, I have been you're doing young, comedy five years. You're, you're very young. And I'm, I'm 29 at the moment. So, so young. So, so yeah. Young. So, and um, yeah, my, my encyclopedic knowledge of comedy <clears throat> is going to get tested by you. <laughs> well, well, the guy who ran the free fringe uh, was a very nice chap who lectured in sociology in London. The and Peter Buckley Hill. Yes. Yeah. And uh, to be brutally frank, tried to do comic songs. And every year he worked at it and wrote a new show and everything. But to be honest, he wasn't very good. Very nice chap. I say that with no hatred or rancor. But he wasn't that good. At at performing comedy or... Okay. Just just the show was... I mean, it wasn't the worst thing I've seen in the world, but it wasn't very good. And... um, But he kept trying at it and so forth. How he started the Free Fringe is a story we might come to later. But um, the first year I went up there, uh, I had this show at the wrong time, far too long, and it was at the wrong time of day, and I, I remember the first three nights I got was four, was that, seven, eleven, and four or something. And then somebody said, why don't you perform at the Fringe Club? So I did. So my first four nights at the Fringe Club were... I know what, whatever I said, uh, uh, 7, 11, 4, and 129. Because doing the Fringe Club in 1983, whenever it was, really made a huge difference. Uh, the number of... There were no comedy agents up there. There was no TV up there. Or if there was, it was in a very, very minor, minor part of it. And you, you got an audience by people letting the dog see the rabbit and word of mouth, and it was 
it was a fringe festival, not what it come, has become, which is now a sort of uh, very, very high-end marketed um, sort of... Industry showcase. Yes, that, that's a good phrase to use. And, and a lot of people still don't realise it's not a comedy festival. It's just one of the branches of what's on offer. But it was very, very different. I mean, you could, and you, not only you could, but you did on stage. If you'd seen a show, you'd say, oh, by the way, thanks very much for coming. If you want to see a great show, why not go to so-and-so? It's fantastic. I saw it last night. It's wonderful. And you'd plug one another when you saw something you really liked. It was a whole different feeling. There was no, you know, I mean, uh, the ticket price was three pounds. Um, my venue just, you put some black sugar paper over the window to stop the light getting in. Got a mic and, a, 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 and an amplifier. There's your show. What what's three pounds in today's money? Just I, for I, I don't know. It's I don't know. It's three pounds and eighty three. Whatever that is today. Okay. I don't know. It's probably about fifteen quid now. Okay. Um, but, then, but it was much much. It was low. I mean, it was affordable even then. Mm. Whereas you know, a few years later, it was like because what happened was all the venues started putting in West End, you know backdrops and full lighting rigs and god knows it costs money mm. and the people who had the venue suddenly realized one minute there's money to be made here costs went up and all and so ticket prices went up and so people who go up there have got to spend a lot of money to see a show which is going to be no more than an hour and maybe rubbish so it's um is that when you stopped going i stopped going in 2000 uh because it all started going wrong Somewhere around 1990, I can't remember the precise year, but the three big venues, as they were then, got together that year and ran, had ran their own little program. They ran a vintage bus that was going from one to the other. And so people who didn't know any better, it wasn't their fault, they would A, use the bus to stop them having to walk. And it was the uh, Pleasance was one. Um, what's that? comedy venue down the bottom there it caught fire sometime later Gilded Balloon Gilded Balloon and then the one in George Street the big um, Assembly Room the Assembly Room they were the big three uh, and all of a sudden because I used to keep diaries of my sales and I'd been performing for ten years and it was like a graph I could see it going up and the graph retained its shape exactly the only difference was in numerical in numerical value the number of tickets sold went down by 30%. Zonk, that year. And never went up again. It was the same shape, you know, year after year. On that Monday, it's less. Tuesday, it's a bit more, so forth. And it didn't change, but everything, you know, a third of my audience was sucked out of it by the big three. And what happened to it next was the TV would then come up. The big agencies started existing, particularly Avalon, who were the most evil because they produced a uh, comedy uh, magazine or program which was based on the design of the official fringe program so people who didn't know any better thought it was something to do by the fringe which it wasn't and people would then th use that as their bible instead of the real fringe and so people only went to their shows all those sort of things started happening I mean, obviously you try and market your show and think of tricks that nobody else has thought, but it was on a you know, little mini scale, but they really gazumped everything. Uh, you then had a sort of TV, um, Channel 4 particular, uh, was in cahoots with these major agencies, and they every year were looking for a usually young male stand-up un under 25, that they could then push, and what they wanted them to do was do their stand-up on TV, move from there, if possible, to a sketch show, and then where they really made their money, if they could get them to do a sitcom. And that was the line that comedy sort of went through from 1990 onwards. And this is going to sound like I'm bitter and angry. I'm not. But it took me a while before I... It, before I twigged. Every year, people would come and see you for the Perry Award. And I always thought that I, you know, as good as anybody else and better than a lot of them. But of course, I never got anywhere near being even on the uh, last six. 
because I didn't conform to this. And I finally got it into my thick head when one of the um, Perrier judges, not one of the main ones, but one of the sort of early level ones, who had been sent, you know, and been given a free ticket. Mm -hmm. And there was, a, in my venue, there was somebody who, they were actually poets. It was a poetry show, but they were hilarious. I mean, seriously, laugh out loud funny. And at the end of the show, the woman said, I remember her words distinctly, um, I haven't laughed so much all week, but you're not comedy, are you? And that told me what I needed to know. They were looking for a certain sort of comedy. And that's why I criticised Chortle, because they too, I mean, it may be different now, but for a long time, they were interested only in drawing very, very fine lines between a very, very narrow range of what's on offer as comedy. In other words, the young stand-up, usually male, uh, who do the same sort of routines, slightly different, and ever so slightly different, this one slightly different, that one, and, uh, but the whole, the whole of comedy juggling, not there, comedy music, not interested, etc etc I'm sure they'll be able to quote me one exception in each genre now and then or you know the odd impressionist or something or other and it was a very uh, now when I, going back to jonglers in the early mid 80s and it was a real variety show uh, there were at least one comedy jug juggling actor show there were people like um, or for example not what a great example he now he now runs he Funny, with untold names, he now uh, runs the council. Something to do with the arts, uh, in one of the one of the councils of London somewhere. Uh, but what he did was his whole act was torturing teddy bears, and it was absolutely hilarious. He had a voice like Tommy Cooper, and he'd come on a bit like a sh fairground barker and say, you know, and now, ladies and gentlemen, the wall of death, the wall of Death, you see, and it was a small teddy bear mounted on a vertical gramophone deck <laughs> while he threw darts at it when it <laughs> went round and round. And we've got the women screaming and protesting, and the men cheering, it was complete chaos. Wonderful act. Now, I don't see anything like that booked anymore, uh, but it was so funny. There but, you go. But do you th so? I mean, my question for you would be. So, in fact, there's several questions that will come out of that. Mm. First of all, given that we're in a, a, well, hopefully a more free market system than, than we maybe are, so the audience di sort of dictates what would get booked, ideally, because if you booked a lineup that no audience wanted to see, eventually no one would come to your club. Yes. So, do you think it's an audience-led change? No. Okay. And do you think that is impacted by so TV, it's, it's, for example, only showing a certain type yes. of... Yes. Because, do you know what I mean? If you, yes, if you only of course, see that... Of course. It's the same with pop music. Uh, you say, oh, people love this sort of record. Well, they're the only ones that they're hearing. If they played records by, you know, if they played more stuff by, say, Stevie Wonder or the equivalent, maybe some underground genius out there somewhere. But no, ever since MTV came in... Uh, because it's so important visually, anybody who's not particularly good looking and won't look good in a bikini is far less likely to have been booked. Would Ella Fitzgerald have got signed up now? Probably not. Uh, and it's that sort of thing that's happened to music, and it's that sort of thing that's happened to now to comedy. You, yes, it's not quite the same. You get the odd older person who's a bit ugly, but they tend to be the ones who've been around a while. They tend not to be looking for anything other. I mean, the example is the Alive of the Apollo. Apparently, they've got an, uh, an actual policy. We only book stand-ups. No other sort of comedy is allowed. So I literally can't get booked there. If I were the best musical comedian in the world, I still wouldn't get booked because they've narrowed everything down. And they want... Because... Because the industry, you know, always wants to do that. They want to say, I want a formula that I know will work. I don't ever want to take chances. So we'll stick to the, stra the straight formula. And, and do you think that's also uh, been impacted by the fact that there are so many more clubs now than there maybe were? That there's sort of, you, you don't want to take any risks because if you did, someone they could easily just find another comedy night that didn't take a risk that was an easy... 
I don't. I mean, I don't find that with comedy clubs. Okay. I'm talking about TV shows. Okay. But they'll come round to a series of if if that's if they get off their bottoms. Most of them will ring up, you know, your Avalons and your off the curbs and the whoever it is, and they'll say, "Have you?" Or if they don't say it, they will be ringing them and say, "I've got a great somebody I've signed up, you know, and if you want to have comedian X, how about having comedian Y as well at the same time?" So it, it's a sort of symbiotic relationship. And if you're not in with a big agent, A, you don't find out when a new program's being planned. B, they're not getting going out and doing their homework by going to the little club around the corner where some genius might be playing or something quirky and different might be happening or anything, you know. They don't do that. And they tend to do the... Um, well, I'll... I'll, 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 I'll if they're any good, they would have been signed up for an agent, wouldn't they? That's their logic. But, of course, it doesn't work that way because the agent is saying, I'll only sign the people that I'm likely to get on a TV show. So it sort of, it sort of works with each other. And what I did, what happened to Edinburgh, I got more and more annoyed that the Fringe Club, the organisation, was not doing anything to stop people like Avalon gazumping the Edinburgh Fringe. And I tried several times to get elected to the board uh, and realised that was something very dodgy about their electoral system. And we made, in the end, about the fifth year, we made a fuss about this. And then they did something else. They changed the system because it was, I mean, there were people virtually voting themselves back on and then we, they changed the system, but you had to get, in there, get people to pay to join. Because before that, if you took part in the fringe, you remember. Then you had suddenly had to pay £10 before you could vote. That was another way of trying to keep us. But anyway, I've forgotten what I did in the end. But in the end, I did get elected. And when I got onto the board, and this is about 80, uh, 1898, 1998, somewhere around there, and I went to the meetings, and when I went to the meetings, I realised they didn't care about the ethos of the fringe. All they cared about was the bottom line. That's all they care about. And they may occasionally come out and talk about how they love the fringe. They don't. They care about the bottom line. And they don't care if, you know, comedy agencies are using it in cahoots with... TV companies and it's all gone very corrupt <coughs> and I think it you know it's all part of that same world where you know Tony Blair and the and the big companies and it's all you know it's all scratched my back and it's all part of that whole world culture now where the big companies win and the little guy loses and that's what happened to the Edinburgh Fringe and when I realized that I didn't stand for re-election on the board and I didn't want to perform there anymore because what I'd loved in the 80s had just died on the vine. I just didn't want to know. And what I've heard about... Now, uh, uh, Peter Buckley Hill started the Free Fringe. Yes. But how many people from TV and whatever go there to find their talent? Not many. No. Well... It's always debated because there's always there's there's usually one story every like five years. Yeah, of, one. of someone getting spotted. On yeah, the yeah. Fringe. There's always one. Yeah, but while while that one is going on, there's like fifteen per year have been planted in in its all. Well, there's there's more. I mean, this year a lot of people, myself included, are not going to Edinburgh, mm -hmm. and a lot of people who do quite well in Edinburgh, uh, myself not included, are <laughs> not going to Edinburgh because uh, a it's going to cost too much. Uh, B, it just doesn't, there's just been changes that don't quite feel right, like, you know, the, the venues moving around and uh, certain organisations not going up in, this year and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, it, uh, and so I think there's been a, it's a bit of a shift because also some of the bigger names, quote-unquote, are going to the free fringe. So, for example, um, Bob Slayer has uh, made a big point of the fact that he's getting some quite big and some quite uh, developing names on the blunderbuss and in the hive and uh, a few other people have like gone from doing the paid venues to the free fringe and stuff and i think that's going to do quite a lot with pulling 
Um, well, look, I'm a, bit, I'm, a, I'm a bit extreme. To me, never mind the free fringe, the fact it's a fringe, if you look back at 1947, it started off there, it was a, the Edinburgh Festival. Do you think they should lose that from their name, is what you mean? No, no, no. Oh, okay. It, it started in 1947, it was the Edinburgh Festival, it was chosen over Prague, they were the two towns that weren't bombed in World War II. That's why it was one of those two that was going to have this arts festival. Okay. And as soon as it started up, I think it was one theatre company said, hey, what about us little guys? Because you know, they, you know, they had the Vienna State Opera here and the, you know, the big posh stuff. And so this little theatre company went up to Edinburgh and said, we are the fringe. Come and see us too. And so in my mind, if you are a name and you're famous, you don't do the fringe. That's not what it's for. It's for people who aren't known, people you've never heard of, and whether they come, I mean, they might be famous in another country, that's different. But if you're famous here, you don't do it, because that's not, it's a fringe festival. And now it's happening, by the look of it, to the free fringe, from what you say. If you're well known, it's not what it's for. You're, you know, you can do big art centres. You don't need to invade and then suck out the audience that might have gone and see, you know, Fred Bloggs, who you've never heard of and who needs that audience. But even it's just like comedy clubs are being denuded of audience because they're going to these massive shows at, you know, the Hammersmith thing or the O2 or, you know, all that stuff. And they are sucking the audience out of comedy clubs just as these big shows sucked the audiences out of the Edinburgh Fringe shows. They shouldn't be up there. If you are, uh, uh, you know, what's hap what happens is obviously the, the uh, people like your Avalons and your Off the Curbs, they think, right, you know, I've got a name on TV, make some money here. I mean, Avalon were terrible because they were, I mean, Off the Curb apparently are much more fair to their artists, but I know for a fact that they would get somebody You'd go up there and you'd sell out and think, great. And when it, then you discovered, somehow or other, that you owed Avalon £5,000. Because, oh, but you've forgotten the PR we paid for and the this and the that and the blah, 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 And you weren't told about this till afterwards. And so then what would happen is, say, but don't worry, you don't have to pay us. You can work it off by doing gigs for us for free till you've paid off your debt. And what would happen there, again, I'm, I've never been involved personally, but I've been told this is what happens, that they were getting, as it were, £200 credit for doing a gig so that was getting knocked off their debt, whereas Avalon had sold them for 350 or whatever the number is. So they were even making profit on that. So that was all going on. It was all very corrupt. And to me, the fringe is for... I would have banned any show put on by anybody else but the artists themselves. So, was, so you'd have to organise everything? Mm? So you'd have to organise everything? Which is what I did. Okay. Uh, I don't see why you should have an organisation paying for stuff, which quite often the artist then was in debt for afterwards. It, it should be a level playing field, and it suddenly wasn't. I... I agree with the fact that it should be a level playing field, although I also understand uh, companies' motives for... Oh, I understand their motives. Stuff. Uh, but, but they can do that all the rest of the year everywhere else. I've, That's I've, the one place I've, where they shouldn't be allowed. I'm just quite aware what you've said could be libelous, because I don't know which artists you're talking about and how that came about, if that makes sense. I mean, I'm not asking you to name and shame, as it were. Oh, I can you. I'm a friend, an American friend of mine who was stayed here a couple of weeks ago. His name, he's a musical comedian. We he's with Avalon? Or he's with... He was, for that, for one year. We performed in Australia together, and his name is Mitchell Seidvig. And he had that experience. <coughs> Ask around, see, see what you find. I mean, I'm talking about, I don't know what happens now. I'm talking about the 90s. Right. Uh, and I tried to get the Fringe Board to say, if you are a company, you've got the rest of the year and the whole of the country 
to do your promotion in. This is one place where you should not be. That's because it's called a fringe festival. It's not for, you know, corporate PR. That's not what it's for. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, um, what did you call it, an industry showcase? No, yes, it's an industry showcase, but not in a corporate way. You know, if, if Fred Smith and Joe Bloggs and whoever, and they've all got their own, they've all spent their own little bit of money and they've all got their own little venue, and you go up there and somebody discovers them, lovely, good for them. But when they're up against a well-funded machine and they can't get the main venues because they're all booked out by, you know, or they're, they've become too expensive, so they can only play in an attic three miles out the centre, while whilst the Pleasance is full of people booked by whoever, you know, at, or le at least at the main times when people are actually going to go and see them, maybe at three in the morning, maybe different, it's all completely rigged. And I didn't want to be part of it anymore, and I left. And I, you know, I was attacked by various people who said, no, it's fine. Um, you're just you're just bitter and twisted and you're jealous and all you know the usual things they say when you want to criticize anything I mean it's a it's history now I can't remember it anymore but that's why I know I left at the time I've actually written about it in my autobiography because I spent some time trying to remember the details but in general that was what it was all about it become from what was a lovely fringe festival in the 80s to a corporate machine run festival with the fringe society doing nothing to stop it. And I didn't want to be part of it anymore. So, something I, I keep saying is I can't wait to be famous enough that my criticism is taken seriously and yep. is not seen as jaded because the amount of times I've got something constructively criticizing someone else for doing something mm -hmm. and everyone just goes oh you're bitter, you're, you're bitter. You're jealous, yeah. and I'm like well no there's hypocrisy here or there's there's something damaging happening in the long term or something like that and because I'm not at a level yet yeah. hopefully yet that I can say something and it be taken seriously I that's why that's why I quite like people like Stuart Lee who will go out of their way to say things that if I were to say something like you know like you have with like the big four doing something negative or or you know certain tv companies owning you know yeah this this um the, the uh what's the program uh live at the apollo and so only putting their own acts on and all that kind of stuff yeah. i don't think he said that but he's you know those kind of things yeah. if i said that people go well it's because you're not on it you're you don't know but someone who's at a level and been around long enough it, it, it feels uh, well i was told by christian knows that i couldn't be on it because they only book stand-ups. Didn't you? Because, yeah, you told me before we started recording that you, you've you never had a comedy agent, but the closest you came to that was... CK. About two years ago. Because he, yeah. he's been a fan of mine. I did the very first... In, Christian Knowles used to run, probably still does, uh, the ship on the Thames. The boat club, yeah, still runs. And I did the very first day. Oh, cool. And I was booked back on the 10th anniversary because I wasn't... I mean, I, I have no doubt that he's a genuine fan of mine, but... He said he can only really sign me fully once I'm on TV because he can't do anything for me. To, and he, the only thing uh, that he can get me on, he said, was Britain's Got Talent. And I, in a moment of weakness, I, I went in for the uh, auditions. I wasn't chosen, thank goodness. Probably because I look professional and that's not what they want, is it? They, want, they don't want people to, look, to be looking worried at whatever they're going to say. These three people who probably haven't got any talent between the three of them, um, half the time. Um, and I'm thinking, I didn't actually want to be on this programme. I'm actually quite relieved. But then I said, well, why don't you get me on the Royal Variety Show? That's the show I should be on. It's called the Royal Variety Show. I'm a variety act. Book me on there. But, you know, I don't know how that's done, and I'm not on it. Were I to be on it... He might be ringing me up and say, oh, right, great, now I can do something for you. Um, but that's the nearest I've ever had to, uh, to having an agent. But they know that music, music comedians, mm, it's a bit like, it's a bit like impressionists. You tend to find each generation 
you think of just one, uh, maybe two, you know, but no more. Uh, so uh, it was a guy who used to do Howard Wilson for a while, whatever his name was, um, and then it's somebody else, and it, uh, then it's somebody else. And music comedians, uh, you can really count them on one hand, can't you? And even then, they tend to be people who are best known for their stand-up, but they also do music. Um, I don't know of somebody who does comedy, so yes I do, uh, that's my old mate who's on the Now Show. That's it, there's nobody else. Th this is more logistical questions than mm. anything else. How many gigs a year do you do? And it's just all gigs. I'm not sure. I reckon, because you know, you might have a run of gigs yeah. on the tour and then you might have nothing, you know. Yeah. So I reckon, on average, I would do something like, say, 400 gigs a year, I don't know, something like that. Okay. And what would be the breakdown of comedy clubs versus musical touring? Well, it's more it's, it's more complicated than that. Okay. Okay, These this is the mixture. And you can find it on my site because I've got it colour-coded. Mm -hmm. You do a comedy club, which gets you, what, 100, 150 quid maybe? Something of that nature. But while you're there, somebody comes up to you and says, I really enjoyed that. I'm getting married in March. Would you like to come and do my show? Or they turn out to be a very rich person that you don't recognise, and they say, I would love you to do my party. Uh, or somebody sees you and they come from another country, or whatever. Uh, and so you've got a range of things. And then I'm also trying to get back to Lake Crazy Cop, which is a music venue, Ronnie Scott's, I'm doing the Royal Albert Hall this coming month. They've got a cabaret room at the Albert Hall. So I'm doing those too. So, <coughs> and then they range in price. So you've got, let's take the weddings. You've got your average guy who's getting married, who's no, got, earning no more money than your eye, and they, they've got 250 to 300 to spend on you, yeah? And it could be in London, it could be further out, in which case you say, I'm terribly sorry, but you've got to pay for my travel as well, blah, blah, blah. And you come to an arrangement. I've learned to shut up when they say how much, because sometimes it turns out they were thinking of paying me 800 quid. So I, what I tend to say now is, uh, look, um, I don't want to embarrass you by telling me what I normally get. So what did you have in mind? And I let them tell me. And if it sounds really too low, then I'll say, well, it's a bit low, and I'll try and negotiate upwards. But they might suddenly say, would a thousand be all right? And you go, and you say, well, why not? As if you're doing them a favor. Uh, and so I've got private gigs of all sorts of different fees. Uh, music gigs tend to be more, but there's less of them. So music fees can be anything between three or 400 to a thousand. Now I've just signed on with a sort of a comedy agent. I signed with them because I thought the occasional cruise, I don't want to be one of those cruise comedians, but you know, two or three a year helps. If I've got a slow month, it helps with the rent and so forth. And you can get 2,000 quid for a week, you know. So I signed up with them. Instead of which, literally last week, I got a phone call saying, um, what are you doing tomorrow? can you fly to the Seychelles? Because this very rich man would like you to do a gig, which I did. Um, so, telling you how many gigs and how many things is really difficult because mm. it's, it's made up of all sorts of weird combinations of prices and types of gigs. But what I would say is, one way and the other, whether they're private or comedy clubs, the vast majority of gigs I do, they want me to do a 20 minute comedy set. Okay. Um, and every now and then, I like next month, I do the music side of what I do, which is tends to be jazz cabaret. Again, I don't quite fit the jazz thing because jazz is saxophone and a trio, a big band, a girl with a accompanying trio, 
da, 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 and a solo jazz singer self-accompanied. Not quite sure how that works. In fact, Ronnie Scott's won't even let me do that. I have to have a bass player and a drummer with me. And now I've, I have one, and when, when needed, they, they perform with me. Um, and added to all that, I've got work that I do abroad. So it's all very complicated. Mm. I just did a series of uh, comedy clubs in, in the Far East. Um, so it's, you, you never know. It's it's very, very strange mixture. Well, no, it's, it, it's good to hear as well, because I think there's... I mean, I, I for a long time thought it'd be really good to... to I mean... The, I think it's good for people who have not been going that long to know the lack of stability or the lack of consistency in month to month gigging because is that not f- oh there's none <laughs> yeah so I mean, we, whenever we, we, I, here's the stability I've got certain clubs that I know like me they know that I work that I'm not going to cause trouble there I'm going to turn up on time do my gig um, this is going to sound terrible me saying the next remark I reckon I get more encores than just about anybody else on the circuit. And one of the reasons is not because I do what I do well, but because I'm doing music, there's something to have one more of, and it's called a song. Whereas an amorphous stand-up, what, what are you asking for more of? Mm. It's sort of, you know... Well, I, uh, do you know... Um, uh, I've forgotten his name. Uh, University of Kent. Do you know Oliver Double? I don't, but he, that's my university, that's where I work. Oh, okay. He, he, university of Kent, uh, lecturer on comedy. He also runs the uh, stand-up archive down there, and I got him on for this, and he talked about uh, the musical generation of uh, performers and musicians, and said that there is a um, <coughs> habitual clap at the end of every song, regardless, because you're so used to clapping, if that makes sense. So yeah, I can totally yeah. understand the take on. But but I introduce the, you for that. He's yeah. really lovely. Yeah. It's, I must meet him because that was I was the very first five hundred. I was the first year oh. at the Ed- University of Kent at Canterbury. Yeah, no, he's absolutely lovely. I, I must go. I must yeah. go and talk to him. Uh, but um, you, it's not. I mean, obviously, you 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 don't do an uncle because you've been clapped for the song. Yeah. But do you not have to ask? The, so if it's a comedy club, I assume you have to because they've got time. Blocks that they yeah. Well, I, I I don't so you can't work, really go back. I don't do. work. I don't well. You, I don't work in time. I work in songs. So I often okay. say to them, "Do you want three songs or four songs?" Right. And they know by now that that means they want twenty minutes or thirty. Mm-hmm. And then if I get an encore, I look at them and say, "Have we got time?" And they go, "Yeah, go on." And I do a go on. if they have not, because you know maybe it's uh, going to be a disco in a minute and they've <laughs> got to get out. Mm. Then I say, "Okay, no." Uh, it's no skin off my nose if I don't do it. And I've got an encore which is short. Mm. And I've specifically chosen it because it's short. So that the audience doesn't feel hard done by. But on the other hand, I'm not, I am not. hate it when people do an encore and then do a quarter of an hour. And I think that's mm. not on. Remember, before we started recording, we were talking about... Or, well, this was a few months back. We were talking about certain clubs not booking you because of the style, the, the musical style. Oh, yeah, there. well, it's just, it's just like TV. Uh, comedy store. Um, Don thinks, that if you're not a stand-up, that somehow it isn't real comedy. Uh, that pure comedy, this is what I understand at any rate, I may be misquoting you, but my, guess, my understanding is that if you're not either a stand-up in the normal sense or a stand-up improviser, which is a different form of it. In other words, if it's music or juggling or whatever else it is, it's not really comedy and therefore... Uh, well, that sort of attitude. But you used to play the comedy store. No, 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 no. I think I've played it... I played the original comedy store. There was a guy called Kim Kinnig in the early days. It was a funny little place. It was not where it is now. Uh, it was very peculiar. You you sat here, as it were. In front of you, there were about two rows of people. There's nobody on your left. There was sort of a wall there. And then to your right, there was a long wall. So you were not only at one end of the room, but you were at 90 degrees to most of it. It was a very peculiar stage. Uh, I did that one. I've played the current... There was a, one in the middle, I seem to remember, but I can't remember where that was. No, there was an even earlier one, I think... 
Yes, there was. In, um, in Soho, I did that one night before I'd really become a full-time performer. That's a long story I won't bore you with, but it's too early for it to... It was actually before I did... Before I even did the uh, comic strip. That's even earlier. I did that once. I did the Kim Kinnig thing. He booked me for that. And then once or twice, for whatever special reason... I had, that's right, I was trying out for the Montreal a comedy festival and we all had to go down there to do our spot, that's why I was there. But um, no, I don't, I never have done the comedy store really, apart from odd, peculiar reasons and things. You mentioned earlier that you were on the early days with like Billy Colony and um, Sasha Baron Cohen, I think you told me about before. Oh, that's different, uh, yeah. Okay. I, I just wondered if... You would ever, or if you've ever been frustrated about the fact that people you started with are maybe <clears throat> perceivably more famous or, or doing. Uh, oh, I mean, I've understood why. Uh, Sasha ran one of my favourite comedy clubs, and I think, funnily enough, Kim Kinnig was involved with that as well. It was somewhere up in North London, halfway up a hill, and it wasn't a pub, it was a bit like doing the Troubadour again because it was a coffee house. Old fashioned coffee house, not like Starbucks, you know, where none of the mugs matched. There was a sort of great big chocolate tin full of brown sugar, some sticky buns, that sort of comedy uh, uh, coffee shop. And I used to love going there because people weren't drunk. And uh, there was this young man who served the coffee, was very taciturn, is probably the wrong word, but he, he was very quiet, hardly said a word to you. I had no idea whether he liked me or not, but I, he booked me, so I thought it must be okay. And then I'd get in my car and dr drive home. And it's only years later, when I bumped into him Portobello Road, that I discovered that young man was Sasha Baron Cohen, and he said that I was always one of his favourite acts. And I think all that happened to him, he was sort of shy in those days, and then is less so now, so now he was able to talk. I'm told that he was at school in the same class with Matt Lucas, yeah, I've heard that. I don't know if that's true or not. I believe so. And uh, Matt, I used to give lifts to when he started out. But I understand why, because exactly what I told you before. They want stand-up, going to sketches, going to sitcoms, or in his case, films. Uh, uh, Sasha. Uh, and that's exactly the thing that they did, and they did it very well. And now they're enjoying the success. But... I don't feel embittered at all because when are, where are the people who've done the same journey who are musical comedians? I can't. Do yeah, that yeah. It doesn't happen. So it's not like somebody's been chosen over me. It's like, it's like I'm a pair and they've been looking for apples. Right. So it's, it, it, you know. Have you, do you, do you think if you wanted to, you could do 20 minutes of straight stand-up without any music or an instrument? I probably could because I, I I found I put it on my website. Um, that you can. Well, what happened was I I'd flown over to the USA, and I'd agreed to play at this funny little uh, fringy type comedy club, way in the north of Hollywood Boulevard, and I was staying with an old friend of mine down in Long Beach. And she very kindly drove me there because by the time, what with the overnight flight and everything, I'd been awake for 36 hours. But I said I'd be there and she drove me there and I did the gig. And only when I walked in did I discover that it was actually a place where they're expecting you to say something political. And that's not really what I do. But I sat on stage and just for five minutes off the top of my head, when I'd been awake for 36 hours. I did three or four minutes, I don't know how long it is, of comments about uh, politics in a very, very minor way. I find it difficult to be funny about politics because it makes me angry. But I did on that occasion. And if I could do four or five minutes there, the chances are if I really wanted to work at it, I probably could. But since my love is of music, and comedy second, uh, there's no reason why I'd want to do that. But if I had to, and my life depended on it, I probably could, yes. Okay, well no, my question, my follow-up question was gonna be, if you can do that, 
is there a reason why you don't pursue gigs in that vein? But you've just sort of answered that question. Yeah, I'm not interested in... in, in I mean, my, my, what turns my soul on is music. If you took a can opener to my brain and sort of opened it up like a, a tin of uh, sardines and took the top off, probably minims and crotchets and time signatures would fall out. Uh, I haven't written any new comedy for quite a while, at least two or three years, but I've written 20 songs. Um, and how many of them are not comedic songs but funny songs? No, none of them. Proper okay. songs. Okay. Um, the last song I read that was funny was, a, again, about music. It was about every now and then, because I'm on the cabaret circuit too, some beautiful young lady will come up to me and I, and I think, oh, this is nice. And then she says those horrible words. I'm an actress and I want to sing jazz. Could you come along to my gig? And you've got to be polite and not say what you really think. And my song is what you really think. And it's a guy trying to be polite. <coughs> and it's called Fabulous. And the words are things like, you're absolutely fabulous. And I just loved your hair. Because he's desperately trying to think of something he liked because she was terrible and he doesn't know how to say it. That's about the last funny thing I've written. I wrote more of an angry song quite recently. I suppose you could say it's funny. Uh, there was a CD being put together about Tony Blair and his warmongering and his greed and I wrote a song for that called Tony Blair, Tory Light which is sort of, you know, it's not my normal romantic song. It's got a point to it. But no, I'm more... I'm. You know, uh, the older I get, the more I love music, and I've got enough comedy, as it were, in the stash to way to do anything up to two hours if I need to, and I'm very unlikely to be suddenly made famous as a comedian, so I've got enough comedy, and uh, I can often go back to the same place and do things I haven't seen before. So I'm I'm stocked up, you know, but. Um, but my brain keeps writing songs. I've written a string quartet. I've written a piece for cello and violin. Uh, music is... And I can just be funny. I'm, I've, I mean, I'm funny, maybe terrible comedy, but I mean, just on a train, I just make laugh, um, remarks and make... I'm the, uh, just yesterday, I mean, just, I'm, I'm not citing this as a work of genius, but we were going past on Eurostar, you know those wind farms? It's like a pole with a great big propeller on it. Mm. And I just said, do you ever wonder what happened to the rest of that aeroplane? And it's it's the <laughs> sort of thing that yeah. ordinary people don't say. It's just a silly, yeah. Yeah, but it's the sort of thing I do all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's my comedy side in as much as it exists. And do you, do you find it, maybe not creatively fulfilling, but do you find it creatively stifling then to do like like too many comedy gigs in a row? Because I imagine if you're doing the same set over and over again, you've done it for a number of years, it's probably not as uh, no, much fun as doing maybe it, new it, songs. I don't, no, not really, because uh, my creative juices are, are run. These are gigs I do. I quite like performing. Uh, it's like somebody who's had a hit with, um, I don't know, if Tom Jones keeps up being asked to sing, it's not unusual. He's probably delighted that people remember it. He sings the song and so forth. And I do the gig and people clap and they tell me how wonderful I am and it's lovely and I come home and that's it and I forget about it and then I do what I want to do. It's, it's like going to work. Um, but does that, does that mean that you get booked? So, for example, there are several clubs that will book me like a certain number of times, a maximum of year, mm -hmm. because I'll go back with you know different material. But I have friends of mine that will go and do you know, a club once a year because they've got a 20 spot and they know that, you know, they don't want their audience seeing that too many times in a... Ah, well, see, that's the other thing that works differently. When you do stand-up, people, I mean, you know, the famous heckler, I've heard it before. Mm. Now, they don't do that to Shakespeare, do they? No. Right. Well, it's the same thing with songs. I get asked for songs that they haven't heard for 20 years mm. and because I haven't done it for a while. Oh, but I, I, I brought my brother, cousin, grandma, to hear you do that song. So, in fact, if you don't do the same song, they get upset. It's the exact opposite. Okay. And if you only do new material, they go, oh, yeah, but you didn't do... Do you, So how often do you release your song, like bring CDs out or, or digital downloads? Um, 
I'm just completing one now, but it's, it's not really the comedy. I've got one comedy CD. It's the one that Sony did. Mm. That was very strange. It was in the early 2000s, 2001. There used to be a songwriter's place in Baker Street. And this guy turns up and I, well, I took the roof off that night. And uh, he came to talk to me afterwards. Hello, I'm from Sony Jazz. Would you be interested in recording for us? Yeah, right. Well, no, of course. Of course, I. <laughs> stupid question. Anyway, so we we We're met. Very we busy talk. at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've got other things to do. Uh, so, but in the end, he wanted me to do the comedy, and I said, "That's ridiculous." <coughs> Once you've heard comedy on the radio, they won't want to hear it again. They won't want to buy it. Whereas, why don't you do a CD of my songs? And be well. But anyway, in the end, that's what they wanted, so that's what they got. I went and performed at my one of my favourite comedy clubs, which is downstairs at the King's Head, where I've been performing for years. And the guy who runs it is a really comedy savvy man. I mean, he really He's knows awesome. his onions. Yeah. And I really like, like it there for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and I did it there, and he made the CD, and just as I told him he didn't sell and it was you couldn't get it on the radio it was it, it was a bad idea one of the worst things was that I had to be and you can see this online it's called Erlokin EPK electronic press kit if you go online to YouTube you can see it he had a nephew who I'd never heard of at the time who he said oh he's an up-and-coming politician I should get him to interview you it'd be good for PR and so I went to this place in Hackney and Boris Johnson came along and interviewed me and I thought this is a strange bloke he made some <laughs> very denigrating mar remarks about the sort of people he'd had to cycle past because they were sort of poor working class people and he wasn't didn't really like being near them it was that sort of remark and then he asked me questions like, so, um, you're a musician, are you? No, I'm a pound of flour. Of course I'm a musician, you know. And it was that sort of daft mm. interview. Um, if you look at it, you can actually see my eyes going, <laughs> who is this? Yeah. What is this idiot? Anyway. But anyhow, um, it, it came to nothing. Uh, Sony Jazz itself was closed down. And anybody that was selling, selling any number of records was then subsumed into Sony as a label and I wasn't one of them and I wasn't really surprised. But it's nice to say, you know, on your, yeah, I'm a Sony recording artist. Mm. The funny thing is, my second single back in the 60s was for CBS, which is actually part of Sony. Mm. So, after a gap of 40 years, <laughs> yeah. it's back, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it's, uh, yeah, that's how that happened anyway. It was... It, it ended up as a as a comedy CD, and it really ought to be a music one. But your your question was, how often do I put out a CD? And this is music, not mm -hmm. comedy. Since then, that was two thousand and four or something like that. <coughs> I did another CD three years later, and I'm just about full. I mean, I've got actually more than I need for another CD now, and so soon. I'm just, I'll, I'll do that. The, the reason I ask is because I'm wondering, first of all, if you have a base of, like maybe a main list of fans no. who follow you. Okay. I, I, I'm trying to build one, but not so much at comedy clubs, but when I do the music gigs, mm -hmm. I've now got a book where people have to write down um, their uh, email addresses. Unfortunately, most people, a, a vast percentage of people, seem to prefer to write in the Burmese um alphabet and I can't read what they've written but um, some of them I can and I've, I've got one of those um, chimp mail things and I, yeah. I, I, I mail chimp that's it and, uh, and I um, and I add their emails to it so when I've got a gig like coming up next month at the Albert Hall I'll send them it's only two weeks ago and hopefully some of them will come and see me um, but I I've got this strange diverse fan following <coughs> I get suddenly approached by somebody who says I saw you play at the University of Canterbury in 1966 I saw you 
at the uh, Wembley Arena supporting Wings in 1979. I saw you on TV in Australia. I saw you at a folk club in 1975. And they remember me and they know my name and they can tell me what I did. So they're genuine fans, but they're very difficult to sort of herd together <laughs> so that if I turn up at that venue, I can tell the people, mm. oh yes, you're, it'll sell out. Mm. And for that, you need television. Okay. Uh, because then, whoosh. It, oh, that's, see, I don't care how much they talk about the internet and you can do it yourself. Yes, every now and then somebody will do it. But still, the mass medium which really works for you is television. Why is all, for, all of a sudden <coughs> Stuart Lee filling places? Because he's, I mean, happens to be a knockout. I think it's one of the most original approaches to stand-up that I've seen on TV for a long time. Uh, and it really works. And I'm very rarely inspired to actually watch an entire program of stand-up because I tend to start looking at my watch after about half an hour and thinking, well, they're very good, but I think, I think I'll have a cup of coffee now. When I watch him, time goes, so it must be something very special. Just as it is with... Um, Billy Connolly, and the comedian who we haven't mentioned because it's a different sort of thing entirely. I was booked to do a jazz show in Blackpool, and I did two hours and came down to find that the main show was only halfway through. So I still had two hours left of the main show. Do you want to come and watch him? Yes, of course. And I sat and watched him, and he was... I knew he'd be professional. And of course it isn't alternative, and it isn't out there and all that stuff. But he was magnificent. Can you guess who it was? I'm gone. His name is Ken Dodd. Really? He was superb. What he does is, he does 10 minutes of what we would call compare material, talking to the audience and, you know, asking what they do and then jumping off there. Then he'll do a song, then he'll do 10 minutes of material with gags and stories, and then it'll go around again. And because it's in little chunks, the time goes by, mm. and um, it just zooms by. We went through to it, and he's 80-something. I went backstage afterwards because I could, you know, because I was at a backstage pass. Mm. He didn't sit down. He wasn't tired. He was, en you know, energised by doing it. Mm. And that's, that is true. I mean, I'm not young anymore. My next birthday will be my 70th. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, well, nothing to be congratulated about. It just means I'm old and decrepit. <laughs> but I mean, there are very few people older than me on the circuit. Um, if Arnold Brown is still working, he'd be one of them. So, something uh, Adam Bloom said, yeah. which I was going to ask your opinion I know, on. I know his dad, by the way. Do you? Very good jazz, jazz vibes player. Oh, cool. Uh, no, I love Adam. He's a lovely guy. He's, mm. he, I ask, I'm going to ask you the same question, um, yes. so you can think of your answer. But the question I ask is, uh, what do you think is the biggest problem in the industry, and how would you solve it? And his answer <coughs> was uh, that the industry at the moment is very much geared towards younger comedians. And yes, he said that he always was. He said that he's a better comedian now than he was ten years ago, even five years ago. Yes. And yet he gets less opportunities because they all want the youngest looking person yes. rather than that. And yeah, just from what you were about well, to say, it, it was me exactly that. the same. Uh, and it was true in the nineties. It still is now. It's very strange. Years ago, when it was you know the time of your Tommy Coopers and you, whoever it was, you sort of assumed that the longer that comedians were doing it, the better they got. And comedians mm. tended to be older. I mean, there's always the odd exception, but they tended to be. Mm. You know, uh, if you think of who the big names were, you know, the two Ronnies, I don't remember them being really young. I'm sure they were at some point. Uh, I don't remember Morecambe and Wise being on TV looking very young. Uh, Tommy Cooper, these were all people from 35, 40 upwards, yeah? Now, and I think it's part of that mindset like MTV, that they think wrongly, this is completely wrong, but they believe it like it's gospel. They're looking for the young audience and they believe that 19-year-olds will only watch 19-year-olds. And so they want 19-year-olds because they think, oh, uh, I work for 19-year-olds all the time. It is no problem. It really isn't. And as long as you don't, there's something in your 
mind or personality which hasn't got old, you're on the same wavelength as them. It's not important that I don't listen to the same pop music. They know that I'm thinking the same way they do in many ways. Mm. Why has Jeremy Corbyn got the young vote? By the way, going back to him, what you said about yourself, about what you said being taken seriously. Think of Jack Jeremy Corbyn 18 months ago, a lone voice mm. from the left as they saw it on the back benches. All of a sudden, he's leading the party. Yeah. They have to take notice of what he says. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but it's it's not true that it that's the reason they do it because they think they want the young audience and then they'll only watch young people when i was 10 years old i was listening to comedy on the radio and they were called the goons and they were absolutely hilarious and i don't know how old they were but certainly more than 40 now why have you but they believe this lie and that's why uh, a, a very another good example of somebody's improved. Uh, I mean, not that he was bad in the first place, but he's just so smooth and effortless now. If you watch Ian Stone, right, Ian, yeah, he just wanders on stage, has a chat with you, and you think, well, anybody could do that, really. Mm -hmm. Try it. Go on then. Yeah. Um, Jeff Innocent's another one. Love he Jeff. He wanders on stage mm. like some bloke you met in a pub. 20 minutes, he's off again. What hmm. happened there? What? You, you don't even really remember what he said, but yeah. you were entertained every well, second of the day. Well, I, I had never seen him before, and I saw him about six months ago, and I can't say that I, never, I didn't forget what he said, because I, I remember it, and I, I, I like stuff mm. like that. But I just remember seeing him going, why haven't I seen him? Yeah, because, Do you know what I mean? Like it was, it well, was, he's not booked because he's not 25. Well, I mean, to be fair, I saw him, I saw him at a club that... I, I, I'd seen his name on a few times, but I'd never been. No, no, not that, clubs. So. Oh, TV. Yeah, yeah. There's there's kind of a grassroots movement at the moment for some reason to specifically get him uh, on the Apollo. I don't know if you've seen that. Like no, a, but he should be. Yeah. Um, right. I've got some quick fire questions. Something good. Evans as well. What's his name? Who ought to be? He, he was on Apollo, but he. You see him very rarely. Is it Simon Evans? Maybe. I'm terrible with names. It's okay. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've got some quick Go questions. I ask these questions to every guest, so, um, yeah. Uh, and, again, you can skip out the ones you don't want to do, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Uh, what are the best books on comedy, writing, stand-up you've ever read? Um, don't know, because I haven't ever done so. Okay, I'll, I'll <laughs> drop that. Some of, some of these, yeah, like yeah. I said, so I'll drop that one. Uh, what's the best show you've ever seen? This can be stand-up, uh, variety, uh, music, anything. Let me see. I go back a long way. Are we talking sitcoms or...? It's a very open-ended question on oh, purpose. Okay. Well, in terms of... Well, it starts... You, you won't, nobody else would have said this. It starts in 1950 with, with um, a BBC programme that happened every Saturday night. And it was caf called Café Continental. And it was a real, genuine, proper variety show. There was... Senor Wences, who was a Spanish wonderful ventriloquist. There was a glamorous singer. There was an Australian juggler who was hilarious. And I remember them to this day. We're talking 60 odd years ago. That's one of the programs. When it comes to sitcoms, the two that I like the best, forgetting American ones, would be... Um, Porridge and Yes Minister. Do you they bring back Porridge? I heard they're remaking it or something. And I don't remake it. <laughs> I don't want to see it remade. I want to see it with those people. Mm -hmm. they, they did a Yes Minister recently. <coughs> That's what they do. Instead of trying to think of something original and new, they go, oh, that worked. We'll do something like that. No, mm -hmm. that was then. This is now. Think, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer that comedy is of its time. So I think if you well, mean, goons is still funny, mm, but, but no, don't but, try and no. But what I mean is, is that you you shouldn't redo it because although it might still be funny, it's of its time. You know, whether it was, you know what I mean. There's, I mean, there's loads of sitcoms that I still find hilarious, like mm. you know, Black Books, for example. But I would not want to see that remade. Like what? Sorry, Black Books. Black Books. You never seen Black Books? No. 
I, will, I like Black Adder. I love Black Adder as well. I will send you some links and you can send me some. And links the one, the, one, I mean, I was American ones. Uh, the Phil Silver Show, Bilko. I think that's hilarious. Oh, yeah, no! I used to watch the Phil Silver Show. Mm. I used to watch that with my granddad. Yeah, wonderfully. He funny. was he was really good. Yeah. See, American comedy at that time was written by a collection of elderly Jewish people who worked together. It's, they started in a something called the show of shows and each one had a heavier accent each one was funnier than the other one and the youngest the very youngest of them was Woody Allen so you've got got the quality there yeah one of them wrote that one what another one wrote the Dick Van Dyke show blah 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 and one of them wrote MASH I mean they're all mm. quality quality writing um that was a and now and it's all gone pear-shaped in America I mean friends and uh that's written by a committee, and you've got to you've got to have two point three funny lines per minute, and you feel it. You feel the formula kicking in, and with all the other, and again, they're all young people. Got to be young, and it, no, it doesn't work. Mm. But the, uh, those old shows, they're still funny. Mm. Yeah. What is the biggest mistake you've ever made, and how did you overcome it? I haven't overcome it. The biggest mistake, nothing to do with comedy. <clears throat> I decided to finish my degree in philosophy, which has done nothing for me except get me into non-ending arguments because people think they can do philosophy without do studying it. Whereas what I should have done was to be available for Dick James. He would have pushed my first LP with my songs, instead of which I wasn't available, so he found somebody else called Reg Dwight renamed him Elton John and that would have been me <laughs> wow how did you overcome that I haven't done still working <laughs> at it okay fair enough um what uh where are we going who is the most underrated person in the variety uh sector of the, the variety sector yeah as opposed to stand ups oh it could be stand up if you want yeah um Who's, who's the most underrated person in the industry? Let's do it that way. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to think. Um, some of them are beginning to be rated now. I mean, if you ask me my favourite people, they would have been Stuart Lee and probably the other one that I really love watching is Milton Jones. Mm. Um, but in the variety... Well, I don't know what's happening in the variety world because there's so little of it. There, w there was a little flurry about two or three years ago <clears throat> of of uh, variety clubs, and I thought it might finally turn into a TV show, but it sort of died out again, and there's very little of it going on. Um, I, I, no, I wish I could tell you somebody, but there's nobody. The only person that's broken through is, is Nina Conti. Oh, I love Nina, yeah. Um, but who is, hasn't been, I can't think of her, sadly. Okay. Um, not, see, there's a lot of it on the continent, you see. Mm. I, I work a lot abroad. You go to Germany, you go to France, there's lots and lots of variety acts. Variety is huge in Germany. If The reason I don't do it is because they do a production that lasts a certain amount of time, and you've got to be there for three months, mm. and I don't do that. What I do in Germany is called Kleinkunst. Kleinkunst is a form of comedy where it's comedy plus another skill, in my case, music. music. Mm. And they are used to that, whereas over here you say comedy music and they look at you as if it's something weird, not knowing, of course, that 100 years ago that pretty much all comedy was done with songs. Mm. Anything before World War I, their comedy songs, all of them. And they had people who were writing the songs, some of them wrote themselves. Comedy, songs. Mm. <coughs> it's a forgotten art. It's, I mean, my, my big uh, influence was an American who's still alive called Tom Lehrer. I think I, I think I was influenced by him. I mean, I don't copy what he does, but I'm sure he was an influence on, on me. So, no, there's nobody really that I'm thinking... There probably is somebody that I can't bring to mind, but there's nobody... I can think, I mean, I like the boy with tape on his face. That's a sort of a, um, a, a sort of a variety act. Yeah, I had him on the pod a few weeks ago. He's, yeah, he's, I mean, really he's, he's unusual. 
but I'm trying to think. I mean, who is there? That's okay. No, no yeah. you don't have to. No. You, you pretty much answered it anyway. Um, so, other than what Adam said, unless that is your biggest uh, problem with the industry, uh, what is the biggest problem with the industry and how would you go about solving it? Well, they certainly are, are, are still choosing young people because that's the way they think. Um, just a side note on that, do you remember that um, singer who was a bit strange from Scotland and she sang on the Britain's Got Talent? And she, and she was asked how old she was, and 50, she said 50-something or other. And m the immediate response of Simon Cowell was, was to pull a face of disapproval. Mm. And then she opened her voice, and everybody went, wow. Mm. Now, whether that was done on purpose... Probably. Uh, but the fact that he could do it on purpose and know that it would have that effect, that itself mm. tells you about the mindset. Apparently, unless you're already famous, like Tony Bennett, who's 89, incidentally, uh, you're not supposed to be good if you're over 30. Uh, and it's, it's always it's been a problem in the music industry for some time. It didn't used to be a problem in the comedy circuit, but now it is. So that's one thing. And, of course, the fact that they're only looking for stand-ups, which is still... Now, the only way you overcome this is to have people in power in light entertainment who've got a brain, who will take chances, who will do things that you're not supposed to do. And for decades now, we've not had those people. Because they've had success with what they've had, they think they are, the, but they won't. I mean, not even forgetting comedy or showbiz for a minute, some nut at the BBC at some point said, let's do a show about sheepdogs. One man and his dog ran for 30 years because people loved it. Some other nutter said, why don't you get people opening their attic and bringing out old crockery and showing it to some experts and seeing what it is? And think of that concept, not knowing that there's a show called Antiques Roadshow, mm. the first time that that... How can that work? Zoom. Well, the same thing has to be done with variety. Somebody's got to say there's people out there who are not under 25. I had an idea for a, for a TV show that would be called Second Time Around. And to be on the show, and it's not a contest where some idiot tells them how good they are. Mm. The people on it have to have been performing for at least, I don't know, 10, 15 years, wherever you want to draw the line. If they're still performing after 15 years, chances are they know what they're doing. Chances are they probably got better at it. Somebody's got to invent that sort of program. Somebody's got to... They've got to get somebody with some sort of brain... You see, the population is getting older, not younger. There's a lots of the people watching TV, as opposed to looking at their phone, tend to be the older people who don't really want to see, you know, what we're getting. What we got, what we're getting on TV is soap operas, so-called reality shows of various sorts, quiz games, cookery. And when it comes to light entertainment, it tends to be either quiz games, yawn, or some form of stand-up. And I don't see... I mean, they, they think that Britain's Got Talent is a variety show. It isn't. It's, a, it's an amateur talent show. There was, we had those years ago. But that was different to, say, Sunday Night at the London Palladium. Now, they've brought that back, but they're not doing that properly because they're not picking the right people. And they're tending to have the same sort of acts that were on every other show. And it could be a lot better. They've got to have somebody who's got a quirky brain. That's the only way of dealing with it. And it's the people in power you've got to get to. And they tend not to be choosing the people. Just look, this is the way it is. There are a hundred stand-ups. How many of them are going to be those special ones? 
you're lucky there's going to be five. I mean, the others are sort of, they'll plod along and they're adequate. The same thing goes for managers, agents, and people in charge of TV companies. Out of a hundred, you're lucky to get five really special ones, and they will change the world. That's what you need. Okay. Um, what's the best bit of advice you've ever been given? <coughs> Turn left. At um, <laughs> By the way, it doesn't have to be a bit of advice you've used. I, I, oh. I have to point that out to people because I'm really bad at taking it. Like, uh, you know, like sometimes you get a good bit of advice and you, and you don't always use it. But in hindsight, you wish you had. So it doesn't have to be something you've used. <laughs> the, the best bit of advice, um, and I did take it, but not soon enough. It was from Dame Clear Lane. And it would have been in the 70s when I still had a day job. And she said, you've got to go full time because if you don't and there's no threat of going hungry, you won't work at getting those gigs. And, whatever. and yes, I was scared of not having work because as a schoolmaster you might hate doing it, but you know that every month a paycheck comes in. She, she told me that in, oh God, when was it? Somewhere in the mid-70s, and it was another four or five years before I took her advice. Had I done so, I would have been that much younger when I made myself available, and I'd have been that much more liable to be booked. Um, so that was very good advice. Get out there and do it. If you want to do it, do it young, because you can always do your degree later. You can do anything else later. But they're looking for young people in show business. Once you're found, you can carry on till you drop. But if you want to be discovered, it has to be the younger you are. Sadly, that's the way things are. I don't want them to be that way. There's, as I said before, pe if people with a bit of intelligence and, and imagination got into power, it wouldn't be that way. But that's the way things are, and they generally are. They're always looking for young people. So... I should have quit my day job earlier. Okay. I was going to ask you what would be the best, what would be one bit of advice you would give to someone starting out now, but I feel like you've just... Well, that's one of them. Uh, but, I mean, in terms of comedy? Yes. Yeah, well, I, 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 I mentioned it before. The things I always say are... Opening line, incredibly important... Probably second in importance is how you leave the audience, the last thing you say. Uh, number two, try and develop, again, try and know who you are, have a feel for your own character on stage. And mine is sort of me, but with one aspect of it blown out of all proportions. There is a side of me who's like the way I am on stage, but there's also a shy side and a this side and there. And I don't show them that. I show them one aspect of me, you know, exaggerated and inflamed into ridiculous proportions. And that's my stage character. And then very, very importantly, you have to develop what I call stage charm. If they decide they don't like you, it doesn't matter how funny they find their, your lines. Uh, sooner or later, you're going to drop a line which isn't funny, because we all do, or not to that audience. If they like you, they'll laugh anyway or tolerate the fact that it wasn't a very good joke or give you a groan and then smile. If they don't like you, it'll start going very silent and hostile. Um, and uh, so you've got to get... And it doesn't necessarily mean you've got to be smarmy. In fact, quite often the opposite. Uh, I'm thinking of incognito. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, he can be very, very aggressive and apparently threatening. And everybody knows, because there's a twinkle in his eye, He's joking, and it's not for real. <coughs> so you can have the audience charm in many, many different ways, but you've got to have audience charm if you're doing, particularly if you're doing comedy, but even for any performer. They've got to sort of like you as a person. They've got to feel that they almost know you, and you, you're, that they could, you know how often people who are celebrities get stopped in the street by complete strangers as if they know them. Of course they don't, but they think they do because they keep seeing them on the box. So, yeah, that, those are the three things I tell people. Um, and then, of course, you've got to have enough good material. But 
that's obviously true. But the, the main thing, opening line, maybe closing line, know who you are, and audience charm. Very, very important. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming on. My pleasure. Cheers. That was Earl. I love chatting to him. He, we talked for so long. I've got, I mean, I, I say I've got to stop doing this. I love doing this. I, I love sitting down with people who've been doing this a while, people who are industry professionals, and talking to them for, you know, two, three, four, five hours sometimes, and then editing down what they talk about into a capsulized format for you to listen to. And I leave in as much of the good stuff as I can. I'm aware these are long episodes, and I'm not sorry about it at all. If if this is your first time coming into the podcast, so this is what I do. So yeah, but uh, it yeah, I I really enjoyed chatting to him, and and I really loved every everything. He's just he's just like such a cool guy, and his uh, perspective and take on things is so shaped by his time on the circuit and in his experiences as, as all of us is but because he's had so much more of it he can see the big picture in a, in a way that I don't feel uh, not, not everyone but a lot of people can't so I really enjoyed this and, and I hope you did too if you did please share it with a friend that'd be really helpful um, again got a Facebook group called RC Industry Podcast and it's on Facebook obviously so join that if you can uh, there's a one-off donation button uh, via PayPal on my website which is simonkane.co.uk and uh, there's also a patronage you can support it from $1 an episode which is 80p so if you think what you've just heard is worth 80p and you would like to help continue this project forward please do donate um, I'm going to be doing some pods in Edinburgh next week when I'm up there with Karen Corrin from the Gilded Balloon and uh, I've got a few others that I've got traveling to do that I can't get gigs for around it unfortunately just the timings aren't working so I'm having to take time off work and I'm having to take uh, travel time into account as well so if you'd like to support this and you re- and you would like to help me out doing that please do support in some way it doesn't have to be financial but it would be great if it would because that keeps the thing you like going so please do that thank you very much for listening thank you very much for supporting thank you very much for donating if you do and I will see you all in about 10 days time Bye.